this conference off. will now be recorded. We, um, so we do get a cleaner recording. Thank you, Amelia. So once again, I do wanna welcome you, welcome you to this evening's program, which is part of our summer reading program theme, Tales and Tales, and that's something like um, puppy tales and fairy tales. So tonight we're focusing on the tales of animals and specifically birds. Uh, I have, we have the great pleasure tonight of having uh, Christy Ajmavar from the uh, Mercer County Park Commission. She's been there for eight years. She is a naturalist and uh, the summer camp coordinator. She, um, something that's really interesting that she's done is she piloted the uh, opt, the hashtag opt outside program, which as the name implies, uh, it encourages people to get outside and enjoy nature. And her insightful and inclusive planning, uh, through her insightful and inclusive planning, Christy has taken great effort in creating programs and activities that appeal to a variety of people with different abil abilities. And it has now become an annual event. So thank you, Christy, for that. So sit back and get comfortable uh, for what I think is going to be an entertaining and an informative program to get you started with your bird watching. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Anna. Um, and welcome tonight, uh, everyone. I'm so glad that you can join us this evening. Um, while I talk your ear off for the next uh, 30 minutes or so about one of my favorite topics, birds. Um, and I actually didn't know anything about birds at all before I started um, the job that I'm in now. So uh, everything I'm gonna share with you tonight is uh, everything I've learned over the past eight years. So you'll see that uh, if you take a little bit of time um, to learn a little bit about birds, that you too can become a great birder. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with my presentation. Okay, so um, as we had mentioned, this program is specifically designed for bird watching for beginners. So this is for the person who goes outside and enjoys watching and listening to the birds, but doesn't really quite know what they're looking at. So uh, in North America, we have around 650 different species of birds. Uh, the ones pictured here are all migratory, so about half of the species in North America are migratory. The other 325 or so species are around the whole year. Um, so across the top, I'd like to point out that uh, owls and hawks also migrate. And what I find most interesting is that um, they actually migrate to New Jersey for the winter. So my whole life I spent thinking all birds fly south for the winter. But what I didn't realize is that sometimes I actually am south <laughs> for certain species of birds. So um, if you don't mind bundling up in the winter time, I do encourage you to come out to Mercer Meadows for some of our uh, programs that we have out there. One of them is the short-eared owl walk um, and the handsome owl all the way on the left-hand side there, uh, that is a short-eared owl. So uh, if you come out and visit us in the winter, you may get a chance to see one of these beautiful owls. Um, all the birds down on the bottom, those are all migratory songbirds. So we are their north. Um, in the uh, spring and summer. So they come up here uh, to raise their young, essentially. And then for the winter, they fly down either to um, uh, the Gulf or to South America. Uh, certain species like the barn swallow does a 6,000 mile migration round trip, which is absolutely mind boggling how a tiny little creature can travel so far. So anyway, um, <laughs> those are some of the things that I just find absolutely fascinating and, and got me really into birding and learning more and trying to see how many different species I can find. 
So aside from being a little bit confused as to what species might be around at a certain time of year, we also have uh, some other things that can be confusing. So all the birds on this screen right now are all the same species. Um, the handsome fellow on the lower right corner is a mature breeding male American goldfinch. Uh, just to the left of him is the same mature breeding male. However, he is going through something called a molt. So every year, all birds go through molt. And what that is is um, feathers are so uh, delicate and fragile that after a long migration, they get tattered and damaged. So each year they have to grow in new feathers to refresh the old ones that were damaged. During this time, they can look a little like they are having a bad hair day. The birds on the top, on the right, is a mature breeding female, and to the left of her is a juvenile. They look almost the same, don't they? And to the left is just a picture of all the goldfinch uh, enjoying themselves at a thistle feeder in a backyard. Um, and that just goes to show um, how all the same species uh, all next to each other, um, they look different. And, and to the untrained eye, it can look like it's a different species of bird. So we're going to go over how to tell the difference between um, one species from the next, even though they can look different within the same species. And the key to doing that is making good observations. So we're going to look at how to observe uh, size, color, field marks, which we'll go over in a minute, behavior. Yes, different birds have different behaviors, and that can be something that will tip you off as to what species you're looking at, and sound. All birds have different sounds. Every species has their own specific call and their own specific uh, song. So a lot of times what I like to do, especially in the summer, um, is I actually bird by ear. I don't even look around for them. I just walk down a trail and I listen to all the different birds that are singing around me. And I can figure out or get, get a pretty good picture of, of who's in the woods. So in order to make good observations, we need to think about, uh, we need to go back to basics. We need to think about what is a bird? What makes a bird a bird? So all birds have feathers, they all have beaks, and they all have feet, right? Pretty simple, but it gets a little more complicated. Uh, behavior. Um, so we want to look at uh, where is the bird? What is it doing? So I challenge you, how many birds can you find in this picture? I'm going to give you five minutes, and I'd like to see how many you can spot in this picture. And when you think you know the answer, go ahead and type it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and count more than once because uh, it can be tricky to find them. <laughs> got a 23, I've got a 25, I've got a 20, I've got a 21. Twenty-three, twenty-one. Excellent. You guys ready for the answer? There are 24 birds in this picture. So it looks like most of you got pretty close to that number. 
Um, so birds are all around us. They're everywhere. They're on the ground. They're in the water. They're in the shrubs. They're in the grass. They're in the trees. They're even up in the air and sitting on power wires. Uh, so it's very important when you go out birding to make sure you're looking high and low. When you manage to spot a bird, something that's very key to identifying what that bird is, is where it is and what it's doing. So certain birds, like the duck that's all the way down on the left-hand corner, that duck is always gonna be on the ground if it's not flying across uh, in the sky. You're not gonna find that bird climbing up the side of the tree. You're not gonna find that bird sitting on a fence post um, because it's very specific in where it likes to be in the habitat, habitat that it, uh, it stays in. Um, likewise, you see a couple of different birds there in that tree on the left climbing up the side of the trunk. So just like you wouldn't see uh, the great blue heron there with those long legs climbing up the side of the trunk, um, you're also not going to see those little birds that are climbing up the side of the tree um, swimming in the water. So uh, noticing where the bird is located is going to help you narrow down your choices when you go to try and figure out what this bird is. Oops, I made a mistake. No, I didn't. There we go. Okay. Um, the next thing you wanna do is try and figure out how big the bird is. Now, it's not like a bird is gonna let you go run up to it while it's sitting in a shrub and get out a tape measure and measure how big it is. Um, at least not any of the birds I've ever tried to do that to let me. So what we wanna do is a relative size comparison. So uh, you wanna just make an estimate of how big that you think that bird is. So the bird all the way on the right in this image is a goose followed by a crow and a robin and then a uh, wren or a sparrow. Um, see, and try, yeah. No longer We don't see an image. Okay, I'm trying to fix that for you. Thank you. Yay, did I fix it? <laughs> I don't know what I clicked on, I apologize. Okay, all better? Yes, thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Okay. All right. So um, essentially, the uh, we have smallest to largest, right? So the smallest bird um, you're going to see is probably um, a sparrow. And the largest bird you're probably going to see is a goose. So we use relative sizes to compare the bird that we're seeing to birds that are common to us. Um, so it's pretty easy to tell um, if a bird is the size of a crow or if the bird is the size of a sparrow, for example. So that's something you might want to jot down or take note of when you're going out to look at birds. And I'll show you why that's important uh, in a little bit. Um, the other thing you want to take note of is the beak. As we said before, all birds have beaks. But what a lot of people don't know is that all birds have a specialized beak for what they eat. So if you took, take a look at the two beaks on the upper right hand side, you'll notice that they both have a very sharp curved hook at the end. Those beaks are specially designed to tear flesh off of live prey. Um, so we've got the eagle and the hawk there. Um, and then as you move over to the left, you have a cup, you have a finch and you have a gross beak. Um, those bills are intended for cracking things that are very hard, like hard seeds and hard nuts. Um, and notice how those two are different colors. So that's going to be very important when you go to look in your guidebook or you go to look online to trying to determine what type of a finch or what type of a sparrow you saw. Um, so take a look at that bill. Notice what shape it is and also notice what color it is. I'm going to also point out the last one on the left there. Um, 
we have a fly cat, that's a fly catcher there. And those birds eat insects. So I like to think of those bills as chopstick bills uh, that are picking small pieces up um, with a pair of chopsticks. Um, and below, in case you're interested, on the bottom, this enormous bill is none other than the great blue heron. So he also kind of uses those like chopsticks, but um, except for they don't, he doesn't eat insects, he eats fish. Um, and then we've got the American crow going to the right, and then a Baltimore oriole all the way on the right hand bottom corner. And they're all specialized for what food they eat and different colors. Okay, click. There we go. Um, birds also have specially adapted feet for their lifestyle. So on the upper left, um, that is no other than the bald eagle. Uh, and you can see those enormous talons intended for gripping prey. Uh, on the bottom left, we have a chicken. And I like to think of chicken feet as garden rakes. Uh, because that's what chickens do. If you've ever watched a flock of chickens wander around, you'll notice that they uh, walk around and they scrape their feet on the ground as they're walking. And they do that to dig up the insects that are uh, hiding in the grass and in the in the dirt. Um, so foot rakes for the, uh, for the chicken. Um, and then to the right of the chicken, we have a woodpecker foot. So I like to think of those as uh, mountain climber feet. Uh, notice how two of the toes are facing forward and two of the toes are facing backwards. Uh, that helps the bird climb up the side of a tree. Uh, and <laughs> at the bottom right, uh, this bird obviously is specially designed for swimming. So you see the webbing between the toes. Uh, that is a, um, a duck. Uh, and then on the uh, top there, I've, I've included two pictures for this type of bird because this is the bird we're probably going to be most often looking for. And this is a songbird. So the specific species there that we're looking at in this picture is the barn swallow. And I included that so that you can see how they use their feet. So those uh, top three toes curl around whatever they're perching on. So whether it's a tree branch or it's a power line, um, those feet are specially designed to be really long toes so it can wrap all the way around whatever they're perching on. And then they have that one really long back toe um, to wrap around the back side. So that helps them get a good grip on their perch. Now, what I want you to notice here is not only the different shapes and sizes of the feet, but also different colors. So once again, as with the bills, they have different shapes, but they also come in different colors. And again, this is really important when you're looking at certain species and you're trying to determine uh, whether or not you saw um, a, a brown bird that, was, that had pink legs or yellow legs or uh, black legs. Um, and that makes a difference as to uh, the identification because everything else might look the same, but the legs might be a different color. And that might be your uh, clue that you find to successfully identify that bird. Oops, I keep pressing the wrong thing. There we go. All right, and then this one um, can be a little bit trickier, um, but this is uh, where we start looking at specifics. So it helps to know a little bit about the anatomy of a bird so that you can figure out how to correctly identify field marks. So this bird here, you'll see its belly is heavily streaked, right? Brown streaks. So when you go to look this bird up in a field guide, it will give you a little description and it will say <clears throat> where there might be different colors or where there might be certain patterns. So this would be uh, streaking, a streaked belly. Um, some birds have a, um, a different color rump. Uh, more often than not, that rump is usually white. Um, sometimes it can be yellow. So um, a species that comes to mind when I think of that is the yellow rumped warbler. <laughs> So as its name suggests, it has a yellow rump, which gives it away while it's uh, flying in the opposite direction. Um, crown is important to pay attention to. That's the top of a bird's head. Um, so a lot of birds, um, especially warblers, um, 
they'll have a certain color on their crown. So it might be a bright red, it might be uh, a rusty orange color, uh, but a lot of times you'll see a different color on the top of the head there, and that's called the crown. Um, same thing with the nape, so that you could have a certain color right here on the front on the crown or um, a different color here on the nape behind it. Uh, the other thing you might notice too, uh, back when I showed you the pictures of the goldfinch, uh, they had a black wing with white wing bars. So there was a stripe going across the wing that was white. So that's called a wing bar. And that's important with a lot of different species as well. Um, so you'll notice in that field guide, it will, it will say the certain field marks to look for. And uh, case in point, uh, here we have a Carolina wren and we have a house wren. So they look very much the same, right? They're both little brown birds. The brown is kind of a nutmeg color. They have that really long skinny bill that's kind of curved and they both are holding their tail upright, which is a behavioral, behavioral characteristic of wrens. Um, so if you see a little brown bird hopping around and it's holding its tail up, it's some, some kind of wren. Um, in order to determine if it's a Carolina or a house wren, then you've got to start looking at field marks. Um, so before I tell you the answer, um, does any, is anybody be able to point out a field mark on this bird um, that is different from the other bird? Something specific on its body, a marking. Go ahead and type it in the chat if you see it. Yeah, Cheryl, that's it. Uh, it's got white eyeliner or a white eye bar. Good, that's a good way to put it. Excellent, yeah. So it kind of has a white eyebrow, right? There's a big white stripe going across the top of its eye there. And the house wren doesn't have that. So um, making good observations, this bird is itty bitty. It's probably about four or five inches long. Uh, so being able to pick up that, uh, that field mark there as it's hopping across your backyard uh, is key to being able to identify the species. All right, are you guys ready to practice on your own? I have some birds here. Um, so here are two birds. So let's start with the rock pigeon. All right, so uh, I've, I've included both of them because the rock pigeon you're gonna see more, more often in urban areas uh, and the morning dove you're gonna see in more suburban areas, most of the time in general. Um, so let's start with what you see in common. What is something that these two birds have in common? What is the same? Go ahead and type it in the chat. Excellent, yeah, the, the legs are pink. So that's a characteristic of doves and pigeons. Same shape bill, excellent. Yeah, somebody mentioned the shape of the head there. So you'll notice it's got a really round head and a long neck. <laughs> Yeah, Pat, this is a heavy bodied bird. So uh, big body on this bird. Good. Excellent. You guys are experts already. Great. Uh, now tell me some things that you can see that are different between these two birds. So how would you tell the difference between these two birds using field marks? Yeah, the morning dove is kind of a pinkish nutmeg color. Oh, that's something I didn't notice before. So the morning dove kind of has a blue marking around its eye, kind of a white eye ring, right? The, 
That's a good point. So this picture doesn't show it. Um, it actually makes it look like the necks are different lengths, but this is because these two birds are sitting differently. So um, they actually both have long necks. Excellent. Eye color is different, right? So the morning dove has those black eyes and the rock dove has kind of like yellow colored eyes. Excellent. That's right, Janet, the rock pigeon has black wing bars. Good eye. Ooh, yeah, the pigeon was also iridescent on the back of the neck. <laughs> Sparkly. Yeah, the morning dove has uh, dots or speckles on it, whereas the, the rock dove has the stripes. Well done, you guys are doing great at this. You ready for the next one? All right, same species, but uh, they're, they look different, right? Why do you think they look different? Go ahead and type it in the chat if you think you know. Yeah, that's it, Rebecca. It's it's male versus female. So the male's on the right, the female's on the left. Um, so the advantage for that in the bird world is it's kind of opposite from the human world. Uh, human females, uh, we tend to dress up, we tend to do our hair and put on makeup so we can look fancy for our guys. Um, but in the bird world, it's completely backwards. In the bird world, the males are the ones that have to look fancy and pretty to impress the females. And the females have to look camouflaged and drab so that they can be more camouflaged against uh, the trees that they're sitting on when they're sitting on eggs. Excellent. So what are some field marks that you can see about the cardinal? What are some things that stand out to you that are like, wow, that's that's pretty different or wow, that's pretty specific. So remember, look at the beak and the feet and the feathers. Yeah, the shape of that beak is conical, right? Yep, so that's a finch beak. Good, there's a tuft on its crown. Nice, Pat. Yep, they've got some black around the bill. You guys are looking so closely, yeah. Songbird feet, excellent, yep. Yep, three toes in the front, one in the back, really long skinny toes. Excellent. All right. And the other thing I would mark is um, that the bill, the color of it is bright orange. OK, that's something that that really stands out and you can see quickly as the birds flying through your backyard. And of course, the male is bright red. So. We have. We have three species of bird in our area. Uh, at any given time of the year that can potentially be this color. So if you see a bird that's bright red and you go to look it up, you'll only have three choices to choose from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of female cardinals out there. And if you, uh, you blink your eyes and you don't take a look at those field marks, it could look a lot like a sparrow. All right. Uh, an often underappreciated bird in our area, um, people that uh, don't live anywhere near us, like overseas, that don't have birds like this, look at this and think it's a parrot. <laughs> but of course, we see them all the time, don't we? So what are some things on the blue jay that stand out to you as field marks? Something that you can take a quick observation of, take note of it, and then look it up later. Good. There, yep, there's a tuft on its crown. Nice. So dar uh, Cheryl says he's got a dark necklace. Um, so this in the bird world is called a chin strap. 
So it's got a black chin strap. Good, songbird feet. Yeah, the shape of the beak, what is it shaped like? Yeah, the patterning on the um, on the tail, and those are actually yeah, it's kind of the rump, but uh, the ends of the ends of the uh, wings here, those kind of have the barring effect on them. So three different colors there, almost looks like a checkerboard. Yeah, it's got an insect catcher beak. Nice, Rebecca. Yeah, so it's long and skinny. It's kind of like a pair of chopsticks. Um, the one thing you will notice, though, if you look a little bit closer, and you probably won't see this when the bird's flying through your backyard, uh, blue jays are actually more scavengers, so they'll eat a bunch of different things. Uh, so if you look closely, you'll notice it's got a little bit of a hook on the top of its bill, and that enables to eat enables it to eat um, several different things, including insects. Nice, Anna. I'm glad you noticed that his legs are black. Good. Yeah, don't forget to look at the beaks and the feet because those can be very important. Yeah, and it's kind of got black eyeliner going through its eye. Excellent. Good job, everyone. All right, let's go on to the next one. All right, this one could be a little bit more difficult because it doesn't really have anything that stands out a whole lot. Um, not nearly as much as the other uh, few that we were just looking at. But if you look, you'll be able to, to pick out a couple of field marks here. So what, what are some things that stand out to you about this bird? Yeah, long tail, good. So, yep, the beak is black. Good, yeah, I see that not of you are noticing the heads, the, the pattern, the color on the head. So what we call that is a black crown. So the top of its head is black. And then it also has a black bib. So underneath the bill is also black. And then the white across the sides of the face, good. Yeah, very short beak. Excellent. Did anybody notice how large this bird's head is compared to its body? So that can be something that can be a field mark. So there's uh, certain species of birds that the, purport, the head size proportionate to their body is a little bit off um, compared to other birds. So this little bird has a tiny, tiny little body and a big head. Yeah, and almost no neck, right? So it's just body and head, right? There's no neck there. Good. <laughs> yep. Excellent. All right, let's move on. All right, this one we see all the time, right? But how often do we stop to really look at this bird? So what are some field marks you see here? The American Robin. Yeah, the color of that breast and belly, right? So uh, this is uh, what we would call rufous. It's not quite red and it's not quite orange. So in the bird world, we call this rufous. Yeah, good. Uh, so the bill or the beak is a yellowy orange color. That's important to notice. The room has fallen silent. <laughs> There's not a whole lot else on this bird, right? So on the back of it is kind of like a dark brown. Um, good, good, Ray. I'm, I'm glad you noticed it's got kind of some white stripes underneath the beak, and it also has some white feathers around its eye. So that's a white eye ring, okay? 
And then if you look back here, underneath the tail is white also. Good, yeah, Janet, I like how you noticed the shape of the bill, perfectly adapted for digging in the dirt and pulling up worms. Yeah, the top part of the legs have feathers on them. Excellent observation. Beautiful. You guys are professionals. All right, I'm making it really tricky now. <laughs> the American crow, what, what are some field marks? Yeah, Anna, that absolutely. That is a field mark. The bird is all black. There's no other color on this bird. It's got a black bill, it's got black legs, it's got black feathers. Um, so there's not a whole lot of other birds that are all black like that. Excellent observation. Yep, good, Cheryl. If you take a look at that beak, look how big and heavy and thick that beak is. That is very specific to the crow. Excellent. And again, I mean, you can't see it in the picture because you're looking at a screen right now. Um, but if you saw this bird, uh, you'd be able to tell its relative size, right? So this bird is a lot bigger than a robin, but also a lot smaller than um, a, a goose. Um, so you'll be able to tell the size. Oh, okay, yeah, the, the size of the eyes um, are not very big compared to the size of the body. Yeah, good, excellent. So I heard somewhere that uh, American crows are actually as smart as three-year-old children, um, which is really quite fascinating. Um, they can solve puzzles and whatnot. So another very underappreciated common bird in our area. Uh, and then the last one uh, is is another tricky one that you might see. So um, if you remember way back in the beginning of this presentation, I said that uh, one of the um, key characteristic observations that you can make is a bird's behavior. So what's something you notice that all three of these birds are doing? They're all climbing vertically up a tree, that's right. So there's only certain birds that are able to do that. So it's important to take note what the bird is doing when you see it. Yep, it's got those mountain climber feet, two hooks in the back and two hooks in the front. Beautiful. All right, so here's where we're gonna get a little bit tricky. So the bird all the way on the right looks a lot different than the two that are on the left but all three of these are different species. So um, let's take a look at the two on the left. They look almost identical, but what are some things that you can find that are different? Excellent. Yes, so the one on the left, if you look at the beak, it's about half the size of the bill of the bird that's on the right. So on the far left, we have a downy woodpecker and the downy woodpecker is about, mm, ha about half the size of the hairy woodpecker. The hairy woodpecker is the one in the middle there. Um, but that's not something you can really see unless you happen to see one of these guys side by side. And that's probably never going to happen. So what you want to look at is that bill. All right. And if you look at it from a distance, you can see that the downy woodpecker's bill is shorter than the length of its head. And the hairy woodpecker's bill is about the same length of its head. 
All right, so that's one of those tricky observations that you can look, you see a black and white bird, it's got speckles, it's climbing sideways up a tree, it's got to either be a downy or a hairy, then you've got to look at that bill and try and figure out what it is from there. And then the woodpecker all the way on the right here is a red-bellied woodpecker. Um, it doesn't really have a red belly in the picture. Um, and the red belly is actually very difficult to see. It happens to be um, in between the bird's legs. And since it's always climbing up a tree, it's not something you're ever going to see. Um, but something to note on this bird is that the black and white patterns are different from the patterns of the birds on the left. Um, so this is this patterning is what we call barring, B-A-R-R-I-N-G, barring pattern. That's black and white kind of stripey corduroy type of pattern. And then, of course, you've got the top of the head is red. All right, so I hope you all learned something this evening and you enjoyed this presentation. Um, I do wanna direct you to a couple of resources. So my favorite go-to website is allaboutbirds.org. It's through Cornell University. Um, and they have an app you can put on your cell phone called Merlin. And what Merlin does is it has a uh, catalog of different birds that can possibly be in your area. And then you type in all the observations we just went over. So what were the overall colors? Um, how big was it? Where was it uh, hanging out? Was it doing any special behaviors? Uh, and then it will give you a list of potential birds that you could have seen. The other new thing that they just recently added is um, an app that will, um, or I'm sorry, a, a part of the app will now let you record the songs that the birds are singing, and it will give you suggestions as to what those, um, what it thinks those birds were. Um, so really quick, I just want to share that with you. Um, so let me exit out of that and go over here. Um, so here's an example of what you might find on this website all about birds. So here's the Northern Cardinal we were talking about, um, and it gives you an overview, um, specific identification information, its whole life history about where it likes to nest, what it uses for nesting material, and it also gives you a range map. So you can see whether or not that bird is common in your area and what type of what time of year that bird might be in your area. The other really cool thing that you can find on this site is the sounds that each species makes. And this is one of my favorite things. Again, I, I love to bird by ear because it's so much easier than trying to see tiny little birds up in the trees. Um, and what it, it takes some time to learn. It's almost like learning another language, but once you learn it and practice it, it's almost like you know, you're, you're suddenly bilingual, you speak bird. So uh, here it gives you the song and then also the calls that it makes. So here is the, I'll play it for you. Let's see if you can hear it. We had a little bit of trouble earlier. It was very faint. And over here on the right, it describes what that song sounds like. So here it says, cheer, cheer, birdie, birdie, birdie. Um, and you can kind of hear that as the bird sings. It says, cheer, cheer, birdie, birdie, birdie. And then the call is different. It's a very sharp spit, sip. So if you've got some free time and can sit in your backyard and listen to your birds, see how many different sounds you can hear in your backyard. Um, where is it? Exit. Okay, so now I would love to open up the floor for Q&A. Anybody have any questions or comments about anything we've learned this evening? First of all, Christy, I do want to let people know that they that as Christy had said, all of you were amazing tonight in the chat. I mean, it's like your pros at not only go to meeting, but 
actually birding as well. I mean, I was so impressed with what you were finding when we were comparing pictures. Um, so d I do encourage you to enter questions into the chat. I do have a couple that kind of came up while we were answering um, your questions, Christy. And I do want to sure. thank you because it really, it, when I'm out looking for birds, I really have always focused on the color. And yeah. just when you said to think about um, where it's located, what is it doing? Um, and really what else to look at besides the bright colors that you're seeing. I feel like I'm already seeing a whole new world just, just in that. And I'm excited to go and learn how to talk bird because I think that's interesting too, because I do will hear things. I think sometimes those senses um, together could be something that's very powerful when you're out looking for birds. Absolutely. So, one of, so I do want to thank you. I, I'm walking away with some new tools tonight, so I'm excited. Um, so one of the questions that had come up was, uh, how can we attract more varieties of birds to our feeders? Excellent. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, if you're trying to attract different species, you have to remember what they're adapted to eat. So some birds are adapted to eat seeds. Other birds are adapted to eat insects and other birds are adapted to eat fruits. Um, if you think about the hummingbird, the hummingbird isn't going to come visit a feeder with seeds at it. It's going to come visit a, a hummingbird feeder that's specific for that bird. It's got sugar water in it, which mimics nectar. Um, so some people put out um, shelled peanuts if they want to attract things like blueberry, blue jays. Um, some people put out uh, thistle if they want to attract finches. Um, I love to put out uh, black oil sunflower seeds because um, they're an excellent source of nutrients, but also uh, to me seem like they attract the, the most number of species. But of course, you're going to get a lot of the common birds that come to feed on um, sunflower seeds. So um, nuthatch and chickadee and titmouse, um, cardinals, um, even woodpeckers will come uh, uh, check out your seed. Um, if you want to get specific to woodpeckers, um, and again, you're going to have other birds that are going to come visit this feeder too, but uh, woodpeckers will definitely come visit it. You want to put out a block of suet, um, and basically it's a big chunk of lard with seeds mixed in, seeds and insects mixed in, and you put it in a little cage and you hang it. Um, so you've got that, and then uh, in the uh, I guess you can put it out year round. So uh, certain species of birds, they're insectivores. They really need to eat those insects. So um, like bluebirds, if you put out a, um, there's, you can get a little tray with a little roof over it. It's a different type of bird feeder. And you can put out dried mealworms um, in that tray for uh, things like bluebirds and woodpeckers and other species that are specific to, uh, to eating insects. Thank you so much. There was another question, and um, Merle, this was from you, um, and I think you might have just answered it, but I'm going to go ahead and ask the question, and then if Merle needs to follow up with, no, that's not what I meant, then she, she we can give her time to do that. But she asked, why have birds switched from one bird feeder to another? And I'm wondering if that's what you were talking about, that there's certain um, seeds that they're looking for or certain uh, the food, the types of food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if you go into ShopRite, for example, and you just buy a bag of wild bird food, it's got a bunch of different types of seeds mixed in there, including uh, cracked corn. So um, in mixed feeders like that, uh, the bird will come to the feeder and it will pick through and find what it wants to eat and throw uh, the rest of it on the ground. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then Katie asked, if feeding birds, what do you suggest is the oh, is the best bird seed? What to look for, for in the bag? So that's kind of what you just said. If you're just going to do a wild mix, then you're really kind of at their mercy, whatever they give you. Yeah, and, and that's it. And I will suggest to uh, try to look for bird foods that um, come from good sources. So mm -hmm. um, some some bird seed is uh, sold that is um, treated with uh, herbicides or pesticides um, or um, just comes from like an unclean factory. They it might have mold in it. Um, so if, if we're going to do our backyard birds a favor and feed them, let's try and feed them something that is is healthy and good for them. So um, 
Autobahn has a, a really good brand of black oil sunflower seed. I think they might even have a wild bird mix as well. Um, but they say right on the packaging, it's all USA grown, it's uh, non-GMO, et cetera, et cetera. So it's um, a much healthier option than whatever you might pick up at ShopRite. <laughs> Excellent. And then, and it's just, these are just things that I had never thought about, and I'm sure others didn't either, you know, what is actually in the bag of this bird seed that we're getting. Um, mm -hmm. Bernadette asks, or says, I recently read in the paper not to feed birds in our area because some are showing signs of neuro neurological problems and bulging eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there's a mystery illness that's been going around in our wild songbirds um, starting this spring. It just popped up and uh, they actually don't even know it's, if it's from bird feeders or spread from bird feeders or not. Um, and their recommendation is if you find birds in your yard with this uh, ailment, then you should take your feeders down. Um, if you're not seeing those in your area or in your yard, then you don't really have to worry about it. But it is good practice to take down your bird feeders once a week and clean them out with bleach because there's a lot of other bird diseases that uh, they can pass on from, from one individual to another. Excellent. Thank you for that question, Bernadette. Um, and then um, Kate is asking, what are some native plants that attract birds? <laughs> Do you have another hour? <laughs> <laughs> That's another program. <laughs> uh, that is another program, yeah. Um, I, I am so happy though, that um, Kate, that you were asking about native plants because I am a huge fan and advocate for native plants. Um, no matter what native plant you pick for your yard, it's going to be good because there's going to be something that can eat it or utilize it in some way. So, um, but s specifically for birds, um, uh, hummingbirds, they love uh, the deep red tubular flowers. So uh, cardinal flower is fantastic. Um, uh, trumpet honeysuckle is fantastic. Coral honeysuckle is fantastic. I've even had them visiting my bee bomb, my scarlet bee bomb, which is in the Monarda um, family. So uh, they'll visit anything that's got that, that deep tubular flower. Um, in terms of like um, finch, um, they really love to go for the seeds. So uh, tall coneflower is a great choice, thistle. Um, and what was the other one that I saw them hanging out on? Oh my gosh, they were on my echinacea. Uh, so coneflower is a good one as well. Thank you so much. I know that's there's been a big um, kind of a trend that people, which is a great trend um, to do more native yeah. plants and right for landscaping Absolutely. and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then this is this is a great question just because I know my neighbor always complains about this. What type of bird feeder will be for the birds and not the squirrels? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I have so much fun watching the squirrels try and figure out how to get to my bird feeders. Uh, it, it's almost like they're parkour masters. Uh, some of the, the moves that they, they make while they're trying to jump off of this and ricochet off of that to try and um, get to the to the feeder. I had I had one squirrel that had figured out that if he jumped off of a tree branch and uh, used the um, dead tree stump that was cut off as kind of like a ricochet point that he could get enough um, trajectory to make it to the bird feeder. So we had to move the feeder out another foot away from the trees so that he couldn't do that. It was hilarious. Um, but yeah, uh, I would recommend a squirrel baffle um, and put your feeder on a, a shepherd's hook somewhere in the middle of your yard um, and away from anything overhanging that they can climb up and jump onto the feeder from. So basically a squirrel baffle is kind of like a, a it's a cone um, that goes uh, in the middle of the pole. I don't know if you can see my hands and understand what I'm talking about, um, but here's your pole. And then you've got kind of like a, a baffle that goes this way. So when the squirrels climb up the pole, they can't get around the baffle. They get stuck in there and they have to turn around and go back. Thank you so much. That's some excellent advice. And if anyone else does not have any more questions, I'm going to start wrapping up, but please feel free to type another one in there if you want. I feel like we've got we've got Christy here so we can ask her. I want to thank Amelia from the IT department for helping this evening. Um, I want to thank all of you for attending uh, to coming out this evening. I know that um, 
we all get a little zoomed out and a little video conference down, but I do appreciate you coming this evening. Um, I hope you learned something new. I will be sending out some additional resources as well as some of the information um, that Christy had covered tonight in case you didn't get it jotted down. I've took, taken some notes as well to share with you. And Christy, of course, I want to thank you for such uh, an informative and enjoyable program. Thank you so much. It was absolutely my pleasure. I was so happy to share one of my favorite topics with all of you. Um, and I do want to encourage you to check us out and a lot of the programs that we do at uh, mercercountyparks.org. And also our nature center is now open to the public. Yeah. So feel free to drop by and visit us um, and come check out all the birds that hang around the nature center. Uh, it's called Tulpahawking Nature Center in Hamilton. So hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you again, Christy, and everyone have a good night and stay safe out there. Thank you, Christy.